Monday, Monday. A lot of studying this weekend? Some? You know how I can tell how much you guys are studying? So on the YouTube hits, I can tell the YouTube hits go up. <laughs> and before the exam, it's really interesting. I think, oh, well, people, are, people are watching the videos. People are studying. So I can tell you've been studying. And I'm happy to see that. We have an exam on Friday, as you know. And um, I haven't scheduled a review session yet. I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do a re review session in the evening. So what I may do is a review session at the end of lecture on Wednesday. I think I'm far enough ahead. Probably we can do that, but I'm not sure of that. So I will see what we can do. If not, I will uh, try to schedule something, although I've got something on every single night this week, so it's a little crazy. But if I uh, am able to, um, I will schedule one if necessary. I was very, yes? Well, it's the same thing. When I, if I finish lecturing 10 minutes into the lecture, then you'll have a review session, okay. right? So that's what I'm saying. Okay. I can't go past the hour. I mean, I have to be done by the end of the hour. Yeah, yeah. So, OK. The, le the exam is going to cover, most likely, through all the material on this page. So that's going to include uh, replication, repair, and recombination, OK? But again, that's not written in stone. We'll see how that goes, OK? All right, so as I said, started to say last time, I was very pleased at the questions. You guys are thinking about this stuff, and that's really, really good. DNA replication is a phenomenal process. I'm going to show you a video in a little bit that's going to hopefully uh, hammer home the phenomenal nature of that process. Last time when I finished, I was talking about replication forks. And schematically, I showed you the replication fork here and reminded you that this is a little inaccurate in that both of these guys are attached and in the same enzyme. So they're not separated like you see it here. They're actually both up here at the replication fork. It means that this guy going on the leading strand can actually go faster than this guy on the lagging strand because the lagging strand has to replicate for a while. And then when a new section gets up, primase has to come in. single strand binding protein comes in. DNA replication has to start and then stop. And so this guy, lagging strand synthesis, lags behind. It gets slower. And we'll see that has an effect of doing what we call the trombone effect, where this guy will actually loop out. You'll see it starting to loop out during the replication process. And the replication process is pretty magical. To give you an idea about what this looks like, again, schematically, we look at this figure, which shows us the replication fork. Replication is proceeding, in this case, from right to left. And notice the orientation. So we've got 5 prime to 3 prime, which is anti-parallel to the top strand, which is 5 prime to 3 prime in the opposite direction. Okay? That means that this guy, which is 3 prime to 5 prime, will support replication only in the direction from left to right. And so this has to start over and over and over. Each one of those was a start. And it means that the lagging strand synthesis, the strands start out in pieces. They start out in pieces, and that means that each piece has to be started. It means that each piece has to have its primers removed. It means that each piece has to be filled in. And some of you have asked me, how does the filling in occur? The filling in occurs with DNA polymerase 1. If we think about it, what happens is DNA polymerase 1 comes in here, and the front edge of the polymerase is where the 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease is. So the very leading edge goes chewing through those RNA primers that are there. The back end of the enzyme is where the, the polymerase activity is, and so it starts filling in the gap as the gap is being created in the front. So it's really kind of a Pac-Man kind of an operation, chewing up things here and filling in things behind it. And when it's done, it has a strand that's in place, the, the, the individual units have not been joined. The joining of the units happens then by DNA ligase, as I talked about before. And when that happens, you have completed the strand. This shows us why we need many more DNA polymerase 1s than we need polymerase 3s. Question? Lagging strand started with DNA polymerase 3 that elongated the primer. So yes, polymerase 3 did start with that, indeed. Yes? What determines the length of the Okazaki fragments? It probably 
is related to the trombone structure that pops up that I'm going to show you in the video in just a minute. There's an optimal uh, length that you could make to reduce or make the thing go as fast as possible. And that's probably what is the limiting factor. Yes? Very good question. So his question was, relating to the uh, exonuclease that removes the primary, is it a separate protein or is it part of the polymerase? It's actually part of DNA polymerase 1. So DNA polymerase 1 has all three activities, and DNA polymerase 1 is only one protein. It's not subunits. It's all one protein. So it's a very multifunctional protein. Yes? I'm not sure I understand the question. The synthesis is slower on the lagging strand. That's correct. Okay, so it's, okay, I, I see what you're saying. So your concern is because it's lagging, at some point it's got to catch up. So it's got to get longer and longer and longer. In fact, what happens is the leading strand synthesis has to slow down. So we'll see that there's a balance between what the leading strand synthesis is doing and what the lagging strand synthesis is. But, but you're exactly right. If there were not that sort of slowing down that would happen, you would have to catch up. And that would, that would be necessary to make a, a longer uh, lagging strand. The lagging strand really can only go as far as the next strand that has already been initiated, or the, the next strand that has already been initiated. So that's another limiting factor in terms of how long each Okazaki fragment is. Okay. Um, let us uh, take a look at a video. This video is, well, here's, here's the, well, here's a, a schematic figure of this. Okay. So this is showing you now, here are, uh, they're, they're attempting, they still haven't even put these two guys together, but they really are together. Here is the lagging strand synthesis, and we can see this tromboning looping out here. Here is the leading strand synthesis going forwards. Now I show you this schematic because in the video, it's going to happen pretty quickly. But it's really a magical process that you're going to see happen. This is a wonderful YouTube video. You can see it's at 944,000 hits. Using computer animation based on the latest research, we are now able to see how DNA is actually copied in living cells. Now, watch this guy. You are looking at an assembly line of a major... Here's the trombone. Isn't that cool? Pretty cool. Now, somebody last time said, how is this, all this whole thing orchestrated? Okay? You're seeing that. And it's, you can't even follow what's going on because there's so many things happening in that video. That's why I show you the schematics. All right? And I show it to you not to have you memorize anything like that, but just to marvel in the complexity of what's happening at the molecular level. It's really a phenomenal thing that's happening uh, to replicate DNA. Okay. This is happening not only in E. coli cells, it's happening in our cells as well. We have different named proteins that are doing things, but the process itself is very, very similar. We'll see a few differences with our process in human cells, animal cells, eukaryotic cells, but not big differences. We won't see big differences with those. Okay, well, there's another thing that we have to consider, and this relates to what I talked about before with respect to topoisomerases. We have considerations that are called topological in nature. And these topological considerations really relate to how tangled the DNA molecule gets. All right? So I told you that if we start pulling strands apart and we don't alleviate that stress, we're going to create a gigantic tangle. Literally, DNA will get knotted if we're not careful. The topoisomerases are there 
to relieve that tangle, but as I'm going to show you, they don't completely relieve it. Okay? Let's look at some DNAs that came out of a bacterial cell. Here's a gigantic guy over here on the right. Here's a much smaller guy over here on the left. They both have the same number of base pairs. They both have the same, that is, they're the same size. They have the same amount of DNA in each one. The one on the left is supercoiled, meaning it's been somewhat knotted up. And the one on the right is what we call relaxed. The guy on the left has 10.5 base pairs per turn. The guy on the left has either a lot more base pairs per turn, or it has a lot fewer base pairs per turn. They both have the same effect. They both will cause the DNA to coil up. It's what we call supercoiling. Well, you can imagine that there might be some advantages to supercoiling, and there are, one of which is size. If we look at the supercoiled molecule and we compare it to the relaxed molecule, this guy is going to fit in a lot smaller space than this guy is. Okay? Virtually all DNAs that we find in cells are supercoiled. Now, there's a limit. We supercoil too much, we're going to have too much strain, we're going to break strands. A little bit of supercoiling turns out to be very useful, partly for the reason that you see here. Okay? So the topoisomerases are involved in helping to keep the supercoiling in an appropriate range. That's really what they do. They can cause there to be increasing numbers of twists, that is, number of base pairs per turn, or decreasing numbers of base pairs per turn. Okay. Now, um, to understand this, we need to introduce some concepts that are shown in this figure. And this figure, I'm not totally fond of, but we're gonna, I'm going to work with it. Let's imagine I have a relaxed molecule of DNA. And when I say relaxed molecule of DNA, the first thing I want you to pop into your head is 10.5 base pairs per turn. There's no tension as such in a DNA molecule that has 10.5 base pairs per turn. If I take that linear DNA that you see here, and I close it, instead of being a linear circle, I'm going to say a linear DNA that's relaxed, it'll be a circular DNA that's relaxed. Now, the reason for closing it into a circle is, first of all, bacterial DNAs are all in circles. And second is, if I change something in that circle, and then I close it back up, it can't undo the problem because the ends just can't flop and let the tension out. If I have a linear DNA, they can kind of relax and let that tension out. Now, we have linear DNAs in our cells, but they are supercoiled. How does that happen? It happens by virtue of the fact that they're so big that the ends aren't very much in touch with what's in the middle. So tension can build in the middle, they can be supercoiled, and the ends are so far away that the, the tension doesn't really get let out. It's easier to understand with a circle. Here is what a circle of relaxed DNA looks like. It's got 10.5 base pairs per turn. It has what we call a linking number of 25 that I will explain. It has 25 twists. If you count the number of times that the strands cross each other, you will see 25 of them on there. Okay? If we look at the writhing number, the writhing is how the double strands overlap each other. You don't see the double strands overlapping each other here at all. Let's say I take that guy that I had, I open it back up to linear, and I take out, I unwind it by two right-hand turns. So now instead of having 23 twists, it has, I'm sorry, 25 twists, it now has 23 twists. Then I close it up and put it back into a circle. What's going to happen? Well, this is one thing that could happen. It might look like that, and we all know that if we had something like this, this could actually be kind of hazardous because this strand gets clipped or this strand gets clipped, then that would be da damaging to the DNA. This has the same number of base pairs that it had before, but it has fewer twists. Therefore, the number of base pairs per twist has gone up. All right. Well, it turns out, and so here we see that the twist is 23, the linking number is 23. What's the linking number? The linking number is the number of twists plus writhes. The double strands aren't crossing over themselves. We'll see in the next figure that they do. 
So if the link, if the ride is zero and the twist is is 23, then the linking number, which is the sum of those two, has to also be 23. Let's look at the next figure, where the tension has been relieved. The tension has been relieved by the double strands crossing over each other. That allowed the cell, uh, I'm sorry, allowed the DNA to incorporate two more twists. All right. Those two twists are what we call negative in this sense. And by the way, you don't have to tell if they're negative or positive by looking at them. You're not going to be able to do that. All right? But the, to get the two twists back in there, why does it want to put more twists in there? Why are more twists in the interest of the DNA molecule here? What's it doing? It's relieving tension. We had more base pairs per twist. That's tension. That's what I'm talking about, tension in a DNA molecule. We're no longer at 10.5. We've gone away from 10.5. And if we go away from 10.5, we have tension. Within this molecule, by increasing the number of times strands cross over each other, we also increase the number of twists. All right, actually, we'll decrease the number of times they cross. But like I said, it's a negative versus a positive. The point being that the increasing the number of, or decreasing the number of, of strands crossing over each other gives us the ability to increase the number of twists in there. Now I'm at 25. I've got the same number of twists that I had when I started. This guy, even though it looks like this, is actually relaxed. There's no, I shouldn't say relaxed, but there's no tension in it. It's not relaxed because it is supercoiled, but there's no tension in here because it's got the same number of base pairs per turn that it started with, 10.5. Okay? Now, what this means then is that an equation that you should understand is that the linking number, which is, which is abbreviated as L, is equal to the number of twists plus the number of rides. If you see the writhe number for a DNA molecule is something other than zero, it means that that molecule is supercoiled, and it's supercoiling to relieve the tension. Yes? No, figure's exactly right. So the question was, on the last figure, it says twist is 25 and, ring, and linking number is 3. The twist is equal to, I'm sorry, the linking number is equal to twist plus ride. So 23 is equal to 25 plus minus 2. OK. Now, you should understand that equation. Linking number equals twist plus ride. Right? The two take home messages here are rides of something other than 0 means that you have supercoiling. Base pairs per turn of something other than 10.5 means you have tension. Okay? If you keep those two principles in mind, you will understand everything we worry about with respect to uh, topological considerations. Yes? Okay? So will I repeat that? The quite, the, what I said was the two things you need to keep in mind is that if the writhe is something other than zero, it means that the molecule is supercoiled. <clears throat> Excuse me. If the base pairs per turn are something other than 10.5, it means that there is tension in the DNA molecule. We see supercoiling is occurring, in this case, in order to relieve tension, to get back to 10.5 base pairs per turn. Yes? Okay, so his question is, as the DNA strands unwind and they are replicating, are they immediately supercoiled to avoid taking up space? It's complicated what's happening during that process. So it's not a simple answer to that question that I can give you. At the very moment that they're being synthesized, they are relaxed. Okay, so the supercoiling that happens of those strands happens after they've been synthesized. Okay? Another hand I saw? Yes? Yeah. Okay, so his question is, where is this happening relative to chromosomes that have histone proteins and so forth associated with them? 
It turns out that the wrapping of the DNA around the histones itself causes supercoiling to occur. So that's one source. There's many, many sources of supercoiling. Okay? So the wrapping or the rewrapping of the DNA with the, the histones will cause supercoiling to occur. Okay? Because what you're doing is you're changing the number of times double strands are interacting with each other. Let me tell you one cool thing about supercoiling. Okay? There's a topoisomerase. There are many topoisomerases inside of cells. There's a topoisomerase inside of E. coli that's different than any topoisomerase we have inside of our cells. It's called topoisomerase 7. And topoisomerase 7 is very simple in its function. It's extraordinarily simple in its function. You've seen how the topoisomerases can relieve tension. I'm going to show you a mechanism very briefly, although I'm not going to go into any detail on it. All right? In E. coli, you've got a circular DNA that replicates. And when you replicate a circular DNA, you make two circular DNAs. One thing you probably haven't thought about, based on the to topology, is when they're synthesized, they're actually intertwined. They're like this. So if you have two DNA molecules that are circular and they're locked like a chain is locked, as you see here, what's going to happen during cell division? Well, if you don't separate them, cell division ain't going to happen. Okay? Topoisomerase 7 has a very simple function. It does this. Watch my fingers. That's what it does. It's untangling those strands, just like you saw here. Now, that very simple thing turns out to be useful for making an antibiotic. Because here you have an enzyme that's different than any enzyme that we have because we don't have circular chromosomes. And if you design it so that you knock out topoisomerase 7, you will have little or no effect on our DNA, but you can kill bacteria because they can't divide. Pretty cool. Knowledge of molecular action leads you to medical advances. All right. With respect to topoisomerases, there are, in fact, two types or two general types of topoisomerase that we talk about. One is called a topoisomerase 1. It's something that works by cutting only one strand of the DNA. Okay? This shows a topoisomerase 1 binding to a DNA. There's the DNA shown in red and blue, and there's the topoisomerase binding to it. If we imagine this DNA has tension in it, and this tension is related to the number of twists, that is, the number of times it wraps around. If I cut one of those strands, like a spring, what's going to happen to that DNA? It's going to go, it's going to unwind, right? Relieving the tension. Topoisomerase 1s work fairly simply. They work by cutting one strand and either introducing or taking out, strand, uh, taking out tension from DNA. They work fairly simply. And when they're done, they close the DNA back up so it's like it started. They have the ability to cut a phosphodiester bond, and they also have the ability to reclose a phosphodiester bond. Now, these turn out to be quite a bit simpler than the type 2 topoisomerases. Type 2 topoisomerases do something very different. And they do something that topologically is much more challenging. The topo 7 I showed you is a type 2 topoisomerase. Why? Because what type 2 topoisomerases do is they have to cut both strands of a DNA. Right? Now, DNA gyrase that I described to you early as being ahead of the replication fork, DNA gyrase is also a type 2 topoisomerase. It's relieving tension by cutting both strands, letting them unwind, or wind as appropriate, and then closing them back up. Now, that is a lot more difficult to do because it doesn't want to let go of both ends. If it lets go of an end, that end is flying out there. It can't reattach everything. When I only cut one strand, like a topoisomerase 1 does, it's very simple. Even though it may unwind, that strand is still in the neighborhood. It's easy to reconnect it. If the type 2 topoisomerase cuts both strands, 
and has to hang on to both, and has to let them twist and do their thing, topologically, that's very complicated. Fortunately, we're not going to go into the mechanism. But people asked me earlier about how does it accomplish what it does. It accomplishes it using energy from ATP and a sort of a stepping process where it steps through the cut DNA. And it does that multiple times in order to allow that twisting to occur and the topological um, uh, dilemma to be, to be solved. So DNA gyrase is a type 2 topoisomerase. And there are many different topoisomerases that are either type 1 or type 2. We have many topoisomerases in our body. I want to say we have on the order of about 10. Okay? Quite a few topoisomerases. Yes? Yes? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, this is a very, very good question. So his question is that the topoisomerase has got to stay ahead of everything. And if it doesn't, if it gets too far ahead, then I've said the problem of being too far ahead is that the knot can form. And if it's not too far ahead, the system ha catches up with it. Right? Now, the simple answer to that question is that topoisomerases actually are stimulated by the topological density of the DNA. They're attracted to, they bind to things that have tension. In some cases, that tension is actually a stimulus to synthesize topoisomerases. That is to start transcription and translation of those. Now, I don't have an answer to his question directly in terms of exactly how it manages to stay exactly ahead, but his question points out that you have to think very much about the orchestration of that so that it does stay ahead of that rapidly moving replication fork. A few thousand base pairs is not a long distance. A few million base pairs, like a human chromosome, is a long distance. So cells seem not to have trouble staying that few thousand base pairs away and able to handle that, that density. Okay? A few thousand base pairs away will not create the knot. That's correct. But that's what I'm saying. A few million base pairs away, yes, you would have a problem. You bet. But very good question. DNA replication is magical, guys. Now, what's really amazing is you're going to see more complicated processes than DNA replication. And you've seen DNA replication is phenomenal in terms of getting your head around all these things that are happening. Okay? When we go to look at translation, the synthesis of protein, or we talk briefly about splicing, the removal of non-coding segments of RNAs, we'll see some complexes that are like, holy moly, they're really something. Cells orchestrate really very many things that are interesting. You've already seen this to some extent. Look at what's happening with the ATP synthase, that little molecular motor with that turbine. There's a lot of orchestration that's in that as well. Okay? Cells have these things set up remarkably well. Okay. Um, there's our topological. Oh, by the way, there are some inhibitors. Inhibitors serve as antibiotics. If we stop topoisomerases from functioning, we can imagine that we kill cells. Nelodixic acid is a topoisomerase inhibitor. Another topoisomerase inhibitor, ciprofloxacin. You've heard of Cipro, right? One of the newer antibiotics that's out there. Cipro works by inhibiting topoisomerase in E. coli. Look at this funky triangular triangle right there. Pretty cool. The first one was nalodixic acid. Okay, and there it is. Pretty cool. So these are topoisomerase inhibitors. Again, if you can inhibit a specific topoisomerase that is not inhibiting eukaryotic topoisomerase, you've got something that's blocking bacterial cells but not affecting your cells. That's what we want in design of an antibiotic. Okay, now, I want to just spend a minute talking briefly about replication of E. coli overall. You say, well, we've been talking about that. Well, we have a little bit, but we haven't talked about 
the process. How does the process get started? The process gets started in a very formal way. Let's imagine we've got this chromosome of E. coli that's circular. Does it start in a random place and go? What does it do? We know that it doesn't start in a random place. In fact, virtually no DNA replication starts in a random place. The overall process starts at a special sequence in the DNA we call an origin. An origin of replication. Okay? Here's the E. coli origin of replication. Okay? No, you don't need to memorize that. But I'm showing you this to show you that there's a specific set of sequences that are found at the place where replication occurs. DNA protein A, DNA A, is a protein that binds to DNA, it binds to sequences near the replication origin of E. coli. Here's the origin. Here's where synthesis is going to start, here in the green. DNA A, if I look at it in another way, binds. in a circular fashion. The DNA wraps around this core of proteins known as DNA A. That wrapping around of the proteins causes there to be superhelical tension to be created in the regions around where that wrapping is occurring. More wrapping, more superhelical tension, just like I talked about with histones. What does superhelical tension do? I want you to think back to that circle I showed you before. And when I showed you that circle, I said it can either twist on itself and relieve that tension, or you have the strands come apart. And I said, that's dangerous, right? Well, that's what happens right here. Instead of supercoiling to relieve the tension, the strands down here come apart. And if we look at the sequence of those strands one more time, what do we see? They're AT rich. AT base pairs only have two hydrogen bonds per base pair. It takes less energy to separate these strands than if these guys were full of GCs. So wrapping of the DNA A protein right here favors the unwinding of these so that you've separated the strands. Think about this, folks. When you go to replicate, you see a replication fork. And the replication fork has those strands separated. This allows the proteins involved in the replication to get in between those two strands and get started. Very, very cool. Yes? I'm sorry? Oh, N. N means any nucleotide. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what the nucleotide is. But you see, these are all fixed nucleotides. Okay, now, here is the winding. Here is the loading of the second set of proteins, DNA B. DNA B comes in and binds to the strands, as you can see here. Okay, here's single stranded binding protein that's coming in here. Here is I guess that's what I want to say. Okay. So, yeah. Is DNA B in that picture supposed to be helicase? Okay. What do you guys think? Okay. So what's a helicase going to do? Pull apart the strands. Is a helicase something that's going to help you to open up that duplex? Absolutely. So helicase is going to come in as one of the first binding proteins and start separating strands even more so that all the other proteins can come in and fit. Yes? OK? OK. Um, I said there were several polymerases in E. coli. The first three got numbers. There's actually two others that are not shown on here. And they have relatively minor roles in replication. So I won't talk about them. But I do want to say a little bit about eukaryotic polymerases, because that's the direction that we're headed now. Because 
for eukaryotes, there are at least one or two other considerations we have for replication occurring. And that's what I'm going to spend the rest of the period today talking about. Okay? DNA polymerase, well, DNA polymerase in, in eukaryotes, by the way, I'm not going to expect you're going to know what polymerase alpha does, polymerase beta does, polymerase delta does, and so forth. Okay? I think it's more important that you understand the overall process than it is that you understand the many different DNA polymerases and their functions in eukaryotes. Right? We're going to focus not on what the names of these things are, but we're going to focus on some of the different things that eukaryotes have to consider. Okay? When we looked at E. coli, we saw that circular chromosome, and I said there's a replication origin, and that replication origin is specific. It turns out there's only one replication origin in the entire E. coli chromosome, about six million base pairs. There's one replication origin. Replication starts at that origin, and it spreads out bidirectionally, both directions, goes around, and comes down, and eventually meets on the other side of that chromosome. E. coli has not only an initiation place, but a termination place as well. And that's necessary to clean up everything when you're done. Clean up the mess that you've made in going through replication. And pull the strands apart. Okay? In eukaryotic cells, we have multiple replication origins because we have enormous size. E. coli's chromosome is about 6 million base pairs in length. Our total DNA in our cells is about 7 billion base pairs. All right? So any individual eukaryotic chromosome has multiple replication origins, not one. That's one difference. Do they have a replication fork, and do they have helicase, and do they have primase, and all those things? The answer is yes, they do. We give them different names, but they've all got the same function. The beta clamp, for example, in eukaryotic cells is called PCNA. I heard somebody say PCNA up here earlier. Same thing. It's a circle that holds a DNA polymerase onto the DNA and makes it more processive. We call it PCNA in, in, in humans. We don't call it the beta clamp. But it's the same function. Okay? So we have the same similar, the same proteins or the same functions that are there. Primase, single-stranded binding protein. DNA ligase, topoisomerase, helicase, all those are present in eukaryotic cells. And DNA polymerase, of course. And proofreading, of course. Okay? But one of the things that we have in eukaryotic cells is something we don't have in prokaryotic cells, and this is a major consideration. We have linear ends. Linear ends are a real problem. A real problem. Let's take a look at this. All right. How do we replicate an end? Let's think about this. Let's say, OK, well, we put primase. We get to the very end. We start synthesis. And I'm going to show you a real high quality art figure that I created. Okay. The book didn't have a good one, so I made my own. Let's say we get, here's a linear chromosome. And by the way, all eukaryotic cells have linear chromosomes. With except, yeah, all, 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 of one, all of these have linear chromosomes, all right? We're full. We've got 46 chromosomes, all of which are linear. Now, this problem I'm going to describe to you, I, I hope and I, that you will see fairly quickly. Let's imagine I decided to start synthesis at the end. Now, remember, we have a bunch of replication origins in here, and they're not a problem. It's only the ones at the end that are a problem. Why are they a problem? Let's start with a primase. The primase puts down a primer, and there's my RNA primer in red. I go through, I go all the way through synthesis, and now I've got two daughter duplexes. One here that has a red, red at this end, and one here that has a red at this end. What happens when I take out that RNA primer? I can't add any more to it. I've just shortened the chromosome. So when it replicates back the other way, I'm going to have a part of this first chromosome that wasn't there. Now this shows what happens if I don't remove the primer. It's the same problem. Because DNA polymerase will not copy RNA. In either case, I lose part of the chromosome every time I replicate. This is happening in you. 
It's been happening in me longer than it's been happening in you. And my chromosomes are shorter than your chromosomes are. Na, 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 na. Well, that's not good. It's damn sure not good because the shorter my chromosomes get, the more likely I'm going to start cutting into and losing a gene that I need to keep me alive. Bad career move, Ahern. OK? Bad career move. Well, how do I keep that from happening? Well, there's a couple things that cells do. One is they have an enzyme called telomerase, T-E-L-O-M-E-R-A-S-E. -E -E. Telomerase builds what we call telomeres, T-E-L-O-M-E-R-S, or T-E-L-O-M-E-R-E-S. You see it spelled both ways. Telomeres are interesting. They are long stretches of thousands of copies of the same seven or eight or nine nucleotide sequence, repeated thousands of times. OK? Why? Well, they're what some people refer to as junk DNA. What does junk DNA do? Junk DNA is something that you can throw away without any consequence. So the ends of all of my eukaryotic chromosomes all are lacking anything important in there. Every time they replicate, I lose a little bit more of that junk DNA. But hey, I got plenty of junk DNA, and it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Is it infinitely long? No, it's not. Does it mean that my life expectancy might be that the length of my telomere? The answer is, it might. And there's some evidence that, in fact, it is. Well, that's not a problem. All I have to do is just use telomerase to make more telomeres, right? If only it were so easy. It turns out that telomerase is only active in a developing fetus when the long sequences get put on there. It's only active in cancer cells. Uh-oh. It actually suggests something. It suggests to us that if we were to inhibit telomerase, we might have a way of treating cancer because they would chew up their DNAs and die. And there are some strategies that are actually working with telomerase inhibitors. Kind of cool. Stem cells will have telomerase to help elongate those chromosomes. Okay, that gets to be a complicated picture. Now, suffice it to say that the length of my telomeres may very well determine my life expectancy. Yes? What about gametes? Like, if you're making a ton of how are you Okay. So her question is, what about gametes? And the, and the answer is gametes aren't dividing as such. Okay. They are, in fact, um, uh, dividing once they're in the fertilized egg. So it's in the fertilized egg where we see telomerase being active. I think, if I understand the extension of your question, it is, well, what if I start out, I'm an old guy, what if I start out and I have a kid when I'm 60 years old, as I almost am now, okay? Will the telomeres of that kid be shorter than the telomeres if I'd had a kid when I was 20? It's not completely clear. There are some studies that suggest perhaps we see a um, shortening of life expectancy from old fathers, but it's not completely clear. It's not as clear cut as they, as, it, as, it was, as they thought it was when they first studied this. So we don't know the answer to that question. Probably because telomerase is a bit random in how long it's making things. So I might start out with something short, but I have a very active telomerase. It might build very long types of telomeres. OK? Good question. Accumulation of mutations is a bigger factor in the health of the child. The telomerase has nothing to do with the health of the child. So mutation will obviously have uh, impact on the, any, any organism. So yes. OK, so the question has to do with you know, Down syndrome. And Down syndrome obviously is linked, uh, in some cases, to age. But that's, a, again, a totally different phenomenon from what I'm talking about here. OK? Other comments, questions? Yeah. I'm 
I'm not sure I understand. Let, let me show you the mechanism. Maybe that'll answer your question. OK? So how does a telomere work, telomerase work? Here's how it works. Telomerase is one of the more unusual enzymes you'll find inside of cells. We'll finish this up, and then we'll have a song. How's that? OK? Telomerase is unusual. Telomerase is something we call a reverse transcriptase, meaning that it's one of the few enzymes that can copy RNA and make DNA. It copies RNA and makes DNA. And what it does is it carries its own RNA with it. So let's look at this. Here's the end of a DNA molecule. Here's the RNA that it's carrying, and here's the sequence to be made. Look what it does. It copies its own RNA, and then it slides down and copies it again. And it slides down and copies it again. And it slides down and copies it again. And it's by doing this that those thousands of identical copies end up on the end of your linear chromosome. Now, look at this. I've now got a long 3' end that might be way out over here. Now I can put a primase and start here. I can put a primase and start here. I can put a primase and start here. I've just lengthened the double-stranded DNA part of the chromosome. That's how telomerase is working. So it's carrying its own, pri its, its own I shouldn't say its own primer. It's carrying its own template. I, I, I said that wrong. Its own template that is the thing it's, it's copying. And it's using that template to extend to make a DNA molecule. So it's carrying its own template. I said primer, and it's not primer. It's carrying its own template. Does it have its own polymerase to do this? Yes, yes, it is. So it's a polymerase that's carrying its own template. That's right. OK, one more question here. Reverse transcriptase action is converting RNA to DNA. There are a few enzymes that do that. HIV is, an enzy is, is a virus that has that. All right, there's a lot of stuff there. Let us. Finish off our knowledge with a little song. And the song is a very popular one I have. You guys know the village people? Okay. This is a song by the village people, and we're going to sing it. Yep. Come on. Phosphates are in nucleotides. I say phosphates. Cover bases inside, I say phosphates. Span the five and three primes. There's no need to be real mixed up bases. Carry info, you see, I say bases. Are all complementary, I say bases. Like A, T, G, and C, they have got to be all paired up. Bow, 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 bow. Want to play it with some B, D, N, A. It's got a boatload of G, C, T, A. It's got everything a polymerase needs when you melt all the A's and T's. It's fun to play with some B, D, N, A. It's got a boatload of G, C, T, A. You can make RNAs with a polymerase just by pairing up use with A's. Proteins full of amino A's, I say proteins. Come from mRNAs, I say proteins. Require tRNAs, there is more. You need to translate codons. Like our friend UAC, I say codons. Come in clusters of three, I say codons. Have one base wobbly, now you can go forth and translate. It's fun to play with some B D N A. It's got a boatload of G C T A. With those hydrogen Bs and right hand helices, anti parallel fives and threes. It's fun to play with some. It's got a boatload of G C T A. With those hydrogen Bs and right hand helices, anti parallel fives and threes. Fun play with some new DNA. It's got a boatload of GCTA. With those hydrogen Bs and right hand helices, anti parallel fives and threes. Okay, good enough, guys. Shut up. <laughs>